Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape, a podcast where we focus on people doing rad things in the Australian mountain bike industry, whether they're riders, yeah, whoever, whoever's doing rad things in the industry. And uh, this one is heavily focused on the media side of things as we are chatting with Matt Russo, one of the most prominent mountain bike photo journalists uh, in the country for a long, long time. Before we jump into the episode, though, let me thank a few of the sponsors, a few of the supporters that keep this podcast going. First off, we've got Trek. Trek are one of our major sponsors, and they've helped us out heaps. I absolutely love the Slash. I'm currently uh, going through a few settings on it, but, man, that bike absolutely rips. Uh, whether I want to go full speed, want to dick about on the side of the trails, session some spots, you know, ride to the shops, whatever. I'm absolutely loving that bike and it's hard to think of needing anything else. So head over to trek.com.au and check out the Slash if you want a bike that can do absolutely everything. If you want to keep your suspension dialed on your bike, hit up NS Dynamics. These guys are Australia's number one suspension servicing company. They offer something called the Hyper Performance Tune, which will get low friction seals, high quality oils, and nitrogen charge dampers all set up to your weight. So if you want your be- suspension to feel better than you, hit the guys up. Once your bike's feeling dialed and you're on that new slash, hit up Tailored Trails for the ultimate Tassie riding experience. These guys offer tailored trail riding experiences, whether it's in Derby, Medina, St. Helens, Queenstown, wherever you want to go, they will sort you out. And thanks to their guided tours with an accredited coach, you can ride the best trails without having to faff about. It sounds like an absolute dream and I can't wait to get down there and hit up those guys. If you need to work on your bike, hit up Lead Out Sports. These guys are offering some of the best tools in the country, if not the world. Abbey Bike Tools are an absolute art piece. So if you want some of the best tools to go in your toolbox and fix your absolute weapon of a bike, hit up Lead Out Sports. When you're riding, make sure that you're in the franked clothing. Franked has been a big supporter for the last couple of years and I've always wanted to keep working with them because their stuff is so dialed. It's super comfy, super flexible, super tough without breaking the bank and if you want to get an even better deal make sure you use the code beyond the tape 10 at checkout to get yourself 10 percent off some amazing quality clothing dirt surfers offer some of the most environmentally friendly mud guards on the planet made from 100 percent recyclable material and it's also been recycled in the past it leaves almost no carbon footprint and ditch those dodgy shit looking black mud guards get something custom designed to suit you suit your club suit your business whatever and man they rock so uh, hit those guys up and i believe beyond the tape 15 will give you a sick discount there if your bike does get muddy make sure you use some crush premium bike cleaner on your bike there is nothing better than literally spraying the stuff on and hosing it off and your bike's all shiny. Once that's done, use a bit of the Carolyn Buchanan Crush Shine on your bike and it'll get sparkling better than new. Their stuff is absolutely sick and I can't recommend it enough. And lastly, fist gloves. These guys keep my hands protected. Um, As a mechanic, I need my hands, so I've got to keep them protected um, I love their kit. Uh, just coming out of the cold weather, I'm now jumping into the Breezer gloves, which are super breathable, super comfy, and, yeah, they just feel like you're wearing nothing at all, but your hands are still protected. And, yeah, that's it. Coming in under five minutes. That's got to be a quick ad read for this one. As I said, we're chatting with Matt Russo, so as per usual, grab a beer, grab water, grab a wine, grab whatever makes you happy and enjoy this rad episode.
No, I've been, well, not really, not since getting back from from Europe. I've been laying low pretty mm. much. Uh, haven't even taken the camera out of the bag. <laughs> um, just working, just painting, doing a bit of painting with Lee. Painting? Yeah, yeah that's my, my day job. Yeah. Yeah, I... I work with my brother. He's a painter. He's been a painter, house painter for about, oh, you know, 25 years. And that's just my my day job. I work with him and uh, it's super good now. It's super flexible. Yeah. I, I used to be like full time and it was just full on trying to do that and do photo work. But now yeah. we've slowed down a lot more. So it's a lot more kind of like a lifestyle kind of business, which is really good. Oh, so, sick. Yeah, we still we still work five days a week, but it's like super flexible. I mean, yeah, let's see. Go overseas for six weeks or go away to nationals for two weeks. And it's, yeah, no no questions asked. It's good. That's sick. Yeah. Not so good. How was your trip? Good? Trip was awesome. Yeah, mm. I think it was probably the best, best one yet. Hmm best overseas trip yet it was it was just insane the racing was just like i think we picked the two best races of the year to go to 100%. Um, yeah mont saint anne and, and leger it was just yeah it was just mental the um the crowds the atmosphere yeah it was just crazy it was a, it was a super busy trip we did a lot of traveling a lot of um a lot of flying we had 10 flights for the whole trip it's ridiculous for, uh, like five weeks so we left on on the first of august and got back on the first of september yeah and uh yeah 10 flights in that time but we were able to leave like we live in mount beauty which is yeah middle middle of the the alps up here <clears throat> in northeast victoria mm. and we were able to leave from albury airport which is like an hour down the road Oh, sick. And so we went from Albury to Brisbane, Brisbane to LA, LA to, I don't know, Chicago or something, <laughs> Chicago to Montreal, and then we drove from Montreal to to uh, Mont St. Anne. Yeah. Stayed there for a week for the race, and we couldn't get a really good hotel this time around. Last The last couple of years, we've been, we've been there probably four times, I think, we've been to Mont St. Anne, maybe five. Because Leanne, my partner, she, her mum lives about three hours away from Quebec. Yeah, so, okay. And we kind of turned it into a, a work holiday to go and visit her mum and go and shoot Mont Saint Anne. Mm. So yeah, we, every time we stayed there, we've stayed like at the race site at one a, like a really nice hotel. But this yeah. year that was all was also sold out. We couldn't get in. We had to drive like half an hour every day to get there. But yeah, it was good. Still good. It was brutally hot. Like, was it, was it? It was just gross. It was like cans. It was 30, like 32, 33 degrees, but like 80% humidity. It was mm. actually like, it was almost dangerous for the, for like the cross country riders. It was just brutal. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah. And then the day after the race, the Monday, it was like 20 degrees. Perfect. No wind, <laughs> no rain. It was just, why? Why wasn't this last week? That's the way it always goes, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and then Leger was so after after Mont Saint Anne, we could have gone and gone down to like Vermont and Maine to watch the um, <coughs> EWS, but mm -hmm. I hadn't, I hadn't hadn't teed anything anything up, so we just went down to Leanne's uh, like family lake house. Yes, yeah, like it's in the middle of nowhere. It's like four hours to the closest city <laughs> and you're just like yeah you feel like you're in deliverance or something it's just yeah. <laughs> pine trees and a beautiful like tiny it's this tiny little lake and it's just all these little lake houses like weatherboard lake houses it's beautiful but yeah mm. middle of nowhere so no phone service no nothing it's like one of those american horror movies you just waiting for something to happen but yeah yeah it's nice. beautiful place yeah that sounds insane yeah it was sick it was a sick way to break up break up the trip and then we went another flying 
mission. We drove back to Montreal. It's about a six hour drive. Mm-hmm. And then flew to Zurich. I can't even remember now. Flew to Zurich, got the train to Geneva, and then got a real dodgy bus up to Leger. <laughs> and we were able to, st- we got this this amazing accommodation in Leger. It was like totally, I think we totally fluked it because I was looking at accommodation like six months before the race. I'm like, we're going, I hadn't even booked flights yet. The flights were a nightmare to get sorted, but we finally got it. And I'm like, I've got to book this accommodation. So I looked, there was, there was literally nothing in Leger. There was like a $14,000 chalet (laughs) that we could have got. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's not going to work. (laughs) <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, we'll just stay in Morzine. There was heaps of places in Morzine down the road. It was like 600 bucks for the whole week. And I was like, yeah, that'll do. And I hadn't booked anything. I'm like, there's heaps there. I'll just wait just another week. And then got super lucky. Went back onto the website and there was this place that just opened up. And I'm like, how is this not booked? It was like the whole six nights of worlds. And it was like a grand for this yeah, like right. two-bedroom apartment. So we got one of the uh, races' dads to stay with us and he shared the surprise the accommodation as well. So it was yeah, like right. a one-minute walk to the bottom of the gondola. It was just amazing. That's perfect. And Leger itself is like, it's it's like, <laughs> I don't know, I feel like it's, it's not real. Like it's just this dream <laughs> place that you yeah. that they've made up and like, I don't know. It, the the little town is like beautiful. It's this typical Alpine village in this kind of gully that there's a mountain that goes up one side with the downhill track and then a mountain that goes up the other side with the cross country track. Yeah. And you're in this beautiful village. There's just cafes and restaurants and bars and pizzerias. And it was just like, kind of like bright but on steroids but like (laughs) quieter than bright because it's not kind of easy it wasn't really easy to get to yeah so there's hard there wasn't much traffic there was just lots of people walking around lots of just just like everywhere we went it was just like you'd get out go and get your coffee and a croissant like literally right across the road and you're like oh what are we going to do for lunch and you got you walk two meters and then there's another place for lunch and then yeah it was just Sounds epic. It's amazing. And the weather was perfect. The the racing was insane. It was just like it was a dream week. It, I just can't can't really I can't really comprehend it sometimes when I think about it, like how amazing it was there. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't I feel like it's not gonna get any better than that. Like <laughs> you've hit your peak. I, I really think, yeah, like I, I had a really great week. I didn't have any I fell over, I think, two or three times. But yeah, Monson and I've I've binned it so hard once. Yeah, right. in a cross country race. I'm like hiking to get from one spot to the next before the next lap. And I'm like, oh, I'll just cross this creek. It looks all right. And it was like this real slick black moss. And I just like <laughs> just binned it straight away. And I was like, didn't even have time to react. I was just in the creek, just oh, holding my no. camera up, not trying to get it damaged. And then, yeah, you don't have time to assess yourself. You just get up and run to the next spot. <laughs> I think that's but, like one. We'll just keep rolling because it's such good stories. <laughs> uh, it's one thing like people don't realize with photography is like you're always axing yourself, like just getting yeah. in the dumbest spots. Yeah. And it's always, man, at Medina, at Nationals, in the cross country, like I miss Beck <laughs> twice. Because I I fucking binned it hard once, like fully <laughs> was tumbling down the mountain, and then I got up and I was like, all right, I can just I can get to this spot, and then I get there, turn around, and Beck's like already gone past, and I'm like, oh my god, why well, I've just binned it, I've just missed the lead rider, and uh, she was so far in front, it was super frustrating. It was it was hard to shoot that because she was so far in front, and like you've got to I've got to capture all the other athletes, the under twenty threes or whatever. And the gaps were so big. So to get mm. from one spot to the next, usually it's really easy. But this time you had to wait like 10 minutes and then Beck was coming around like five minutes later. So, yeah, it was yeah. hard to get, get from one spot to the next. Yeah, that's why I don't shoot XC. It's, it's pretty like it's got to be hard to try and do you like scout? Did you scout your shots and stuff beforehand for that? 
Yeah, I usually walk the track. Yeah. Before. At um, I walked when we got to. I think I walked all, all walked both. Yeah, Monsanto and I walked. Uh, the day we got there, there was no practice. There was nothing oh. happening yet. There wasn't even a downhill track walk. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just walking the track. It's actually quite fun. It's a really good way because we've been traveling for so long. Mm. Just to get out of the car and go for a, it was like a three and a half k walk just around the track and yeah, he's always scouting your locations. And uh, Leger was the same. Leger was actually amazing to to walk because it was super easy access in Leger. For the okay. the track. Yeah, it was yeah. like there was like one climb was next to the other climb for the so the first mm. loop they do they go up and they come down. And then they go up again right next to it and then they come down again right next to the other descent. So it was like super, super good access. Like every lap you could get three or four photos in different spots. Yeah, sick. Yeah, it was just, it was perfect to the cross country. At least you have time and multiple opportunities in the XC to go and shoot it. Well, yeah, you do. And that's why I never shoot cross country practice because I'm like, like I can shoot. So there's a five lap race. You can shoot 25 photos of, of each rider that you need to get mm. in the race. Whereas in the downhill, you get maybe, maybe two shots, two or three in the race run. Mm. Yeah. Depending on where you are. Sometimes you can get five or six if you pick a good spot, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Or if you've got multiple cameras set up to remotes and do yeah, it. Not, I'm not there yet. Oh, you should have seen Sven <laughs> in the, uh, was the junior men's at worlds. He had, so he had his 70 to 200 camera that he was shooting up the hill. And then he had two cameras set up on tripods on the same corner with different lenses. So he had a wide angle and he had a, t- a little bit of a tighter lens. And then I think he had another camera that he had so he could shoot the long from where he was and then shoot the wide from where he was. And then he had the two cameras on on uh, timers set up, not timers. He ha- actually had Anka sitting there off the track. She just got there and yeah. he was like yelling at her, shoot this one, shoot this one. And she'd be standing like, five minutes away from the cameras with little remotes just shooting. <laughs> it was so good. I'm like, yeah, you, you know, wonder, like you see everyone's got photos from Sven and they're all different. And like from the race run, he's got five or six photos and you're just like, how? And that's how he does it. He's got four cameras. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's so um, insane. Yeah. It's impressive. What was it like? Uh, is that your first time kind of being around Sven and, and that crew or is it? Nah. Uh, I think so. The first time I shot a big race was was uh, was at Monsanto, and we went there in 2017. Yeah, 2017 was our first one, or maybe 2016. I think 2016 we went there, and I didn't have no, it wasn't. I was in the pool in 2016. So 2017, I didn't have a photo bib. I just shot from outside the B zone, mm-hmm. but I was only shooting downhill because I wasn't really. There was no one there for for cross country that year. I don't think. Yeah. I think Dan was racing. I think that was the year that Beck wasn't racing. She was out. Um, and there was another couple of Aussies there. But, yeah, downhill was was awesome. It was dry and all those guys mm-hmm. are up there. Connor was having a good year that year as well. Mm-hmm. But I think Donnie. Yeah, Dina got second that year as well in 2017. So it was, yeah, shooting from outside the B zone was like, it was great. But at the same time, you're like, this is shit. Like I can... The access is so hard at a World Cup if you can't get into the B zone. But when you're in the B zone, it's like you feel like God. Like you feel <laughs> it's yep. it's actually, especially at, like at a big race, like at Leger down the bottom, just getting through the crowd was like it was a nightmare. Yeah. But when you're in the B zone, like it goes down the whole track, you've got like five meters on each side that you can walk in that nobody else can walk in. It's just media and a couple of like team vests. Yeah. So there's like, it's, it's so good, but yeah, that was the first year that I shot and I'm like, okay, next year I've got to shoot in the B zone. I've got to find out how mm. to get accredited. And yeah, it was actually pretty easy to get accredited. You just got to have a, have a purpose, have someone to be shooting for, send all the documents over. And it doesn't, it's not that difficult. Worlds is a little bit more difficult. They don't let, don't just don't don't just let anyone in. You've got to have like a client that you're shooting for, mm-hmm. and proof that you're shooting for them. Um, which is which is good, I think, because yeah, Wales is it's like 
the crowds are bigger. There's more media there. The presence there is just huge. Like it's, it's, you go to world cup and you're like, Oh, this is pretty cool. And then you go to worlds <laughs> and it's like a world cup on steroids. Every, everyone I've been to, I've been to four world champs now. And then, um, I figured out how to get accreditation at Cairns world champs. And that was when I started to kind of meet because that, I saw all the, all those guys, like especially Boris and Sven, uh, Nathan Hughes, who was shooting for mm-hmm. the pink bike and he was shooting, uh, with Jack and Dean when they were on Intense. Okay. Yes. I got to know Nathan Hughes pretty well. <clears throat> and yeah, when I was in Cairns and I had the bib, they're all like, oh, you got a bib? I'm like, yeah, shooting for, I was shooting for Downhill 24 7, which was, uh, which was cool. I haven't seen much of them lately, but yeah, that, they, they hooked me up with the bib. And yeah, ever since then, like every race I've been to, I've had a bib. And yeah, they all, they, like uh, Boris would always come up and give me a hug and, shake my hand, you know, oh, welcome back. Like, cause I only shoot two or three races a year. Yeah. But yeah, he would always come up and say hi. And, uh, Andy Vathis, who shoots for pink bike as well. Mm-hmm. Norco shoots for the Canada team. I think he's got, he's probably got a couple of other clients too. He's a really nice guy. Um, we always joke around at the start line. He, um, he's a nice guy. So yeah, I've, I met those guys. 20, 2018 was kind of the year that we, that I would hang out with those guys. And they would like one time I was shooting cross country at Mont Saint Anne and Sven would be, he, he would like, he'd be shooting in the same spot and he'd see me with a bib and he'd go, so who are you shooting for? And I'd be like, <laughs> oh, God, right. I was shooting for, I don't know, gravity down under or something that year, or maybe AMB. Yeah. And cause you don't want to say, Oh, I've just got the bib. I'm just giving photos away. Like you don't want to say that to Sven who's got like, I don't know, probably 10 clients and he's, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. I'm just coming in there and I'm, I'm literally standing right next to him getting the same photo and like, I'm giving it away. Like, no, I wasn't, but yeah. So you mm. don't want to, you don't want to do that. But yeah, once I said, yeah, I'm shooting for this guy and I'm shooting for these guys. He's like, oh yeah, cool. Welcome. You know, like kind of yeah. feel like you're, you, you're kind of a part of the little club for that, for that weekend. <laughs> You've passed you're, the Sven gatekeeper. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, um, yeah, it's a cool. That's a it's a really cool, cool little uh, group of people, especially because mm-hmm. all the all the downhill, like Sven and Boris, and Nathan and Andy and all those guys, they all shoot downhill, but they also shoot the cross country as well. They've got all yeah. the all the other clients. They don't they don't shoot practice and they don't shoot some of the smaller races like the juniors. But yeah, they're all they're always there and they see you there and they see you running around and you know it's like a it's like a good kind of brotherhood almost there's a lot of sisters there as well now which is really cool yeah it seems like it's all very welcoming it's the same as like national events i guess ones i've been a part of everyone's just chilling and yeah the banter is high yeah everyone's just having a good time yeah banter's banter's all time at at those big races you know there was one guy oh not not really not a banter story but just to kind of show how good the community is there was one guy at Worlds, um, I've forgotten his name. Armin, Armin is his name. He has a Instagram handle called Ego Promotion. You might have seen some of his stuff that the cross country. He shoots cross country pretty much primarily, mm-hmm. and he shoots a lot of road stuff as well. But he got his car broken into on the Tuesday of Worlds, and all of his uh, car got stolen, like thirty thousand dollars worth of gear just gone. Sick. I yep. saw him the next day and I'm like, Armin, did you get your gear back? And he's like, no, I just, everyone found out that my gear got stolen. And they all just came to me and said, you can have this lens. You can have this camera. You can have all my gear for this weekend. And yeah, fingers crossed you get your gear back. And yeah. And he said, if this was a road race, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't have people coming up to you and, and giving you their cameras for the mm. weekend. But yeah, that's, that's kind of how cool that little community is there's not many that follow the whole circuit there's probably like 10 or 15 who Mm -hmm. kind of get gigs for the whole year it's pretty hard to follow the whole circuit and like if you do the math the money and commitment Mm -hmm. is huge yeah what was um yeah like even as you were saying before you were away and you had like 10 flights and you were away for what like two or three weeks it was it was five weeks Five weeks. Um, 
And if I, so I could have quite easily shot those two um, EWSs, the one in Maine and the one in, the, in Vermont, because it was literally mm-hmm. just down the road from where we stayed. So I could have realistically shot, I could have shot, I didn't shoot Val de Sol, which was the week after Worlds. Mm-hmm. I was just like, it looks like it was an amazing place and it looks really cool. But when you look on a, on a map, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. Like there's no towns. Mm. It kind of, it kind of looks a little bit kind of like a ghetto Alps, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Ghetto Alps. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's only two it's story of, houses and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no croissants. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. So I could have literally shot six races really and i only shot two but yeah that were the two that i was getting that i got paid for and that i was happy to shoot and get a holiday as well so that worked out kind of good was it how many kind of photos are you taking at each race and like what's your kind of schedule like because some people would be maybe like yeah it's sick you gotta go shoot five races why wouldn't you but like it takes a lot out of you right yeah, dude. Um, I think at a world, I think I actually shot more photos at Mont Saint Anne than I shot at Worlds, which seems strange because it was like, I think it was two days longer at Worlds. There was an extra mm-hmm. day of practice. There was junior races. And I only shot, only, I only shot thirteen thousand photos at World Champs, but I think at Mont Saint Anne I shot like fifteen thousand. Okay. I don't, I don't know how that worked. But yeah, well, I must have had just maybe I don't know. Maybe it's the track. There's a lot more longer straights where you can burst a lot longer, especially on the downhill at Mont Saint Anne. Like you can shoot a rider for like a hundred meters because you can see him for so long on those big motorway sections. Yeah, true. <clears throat> but yeah, in Leger, it's there's not much of that. There's mm-hmm. lots of forest. There's a little bit at the top, but yeah, not that's not as interesting as Mont Saint Anne. But, so you're roughly shooting what's that like five thousand a day or something like that? Oh, uh, no, not that many. Probably like two or three thousand. Yeah, which is not and, huge though. No, I'm super. I don't know if it comes from my days of shooting film. And yeah, I don't know. I'm. I don't have a very high frame rate because I've got a, a very high quality camera, but the frame rate's not crazy. So all the newer mm-hmm. cameras. They shoot, what do they shoot now? Like 30 frames a second, which yeah. is. Just, I think Fletcher's stupid. new thing shoots 30, like yeah, it's, it's video. Just, it's just stupid. Like, like it's sick if you're shooting like, um, like product stuff, but for shooting a race at 30 frames a second is like, it's insane. I only shoot nine frames a second with my mm-hmm. 850 so it's a 45 megapixel camera and I've got a vertical grip and a new battery that, kind of boost it. It used to only be seven frames a second. Now it's nine. And I noticed a difference. Like it was, I get, so every second I'll get six or seven really sharp photos and two or three kind of not sharp. Mm-hmm. And that, that, those ones just get binned. But it used to be like every second I would get three or four sharp photos. And now I'm getting double that. Mm. Second. So it made, it made a huge difference. And it sounds a lot cooler too. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's seen those photos, like all the um, photographers in a big group somewhere. It just sounds like machine guns are going off. Just yeah, so it's sick. Sick. I think I think in a couple of years, because all the new, like the new camera that I want to get, which I don't have like twelve thousand dollars to get the camera and a lens to go with it. Um, it's silent. It doesn't even have. It doesn't even have a, a mechanical sensor in it. It's a, a mechanical engine at all. It's all electronic and it's just silent. But it's like, it's probably the, the best 35 millimeter camera ever made. This this new Nikon Z9. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's I'd love to see one, but I haven't haven't had the chance yet. I'm not sure how I feel about yeah. the silent shooting. I've used it before. It just doesn't yeah. feel right. Yeah. There's just something about it. Like you can turn it on to make a noise, but yeah. You well, can actually yeah. It, it's funny, my mate has it on his cannon. Yeah. And he they, at one race he got a lot of shots to the ground because he yeah, left his camera right. on and didn't realize it was just shooting oh, the whole wow. time yeah, it was his hand. Yeah, so I do I do love like 
the sound of a shutter. Like I love it. It's my first really good camera that I had was a, a Nikon F4, which is like an old, probably 1990s, maybe early thousands film camera. And that shot, I'm going to say it was eight frames a second. And I would just sit there with it next to me, just having the shutter on, <laughs> just listening to it. It was like, I don't know, it's like a drug almost. Obviously but, without film in there or anything. No, no, you'd shoot a whole roll of film in three seconds. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, I can't imagine those days. I've always shot digital, so I can't imagine like 24 shots done. Like, yeah. That's one rider. I never... Did I shoot? I don't think I ever. Sh- no, I did. I shot some really early races. Not really early, but for me, it was early, like 2002, 2003, uh, national champs on film with that, with that camera, that Nikon F4. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, there was there, there were nationals in Mount Beauty that that year. I was um just getting into it. I think no, I was at uni. Yeah, I was at uni, so I had the really good camera, and I was like, yeah, this is sick. I'm. I was able to go in. They had a little B zone down the bottom that you could go into, which mm-hmm. um, doesn't exist in Australia usually. But yeah, no, it definitely but, doesn't. Felt, felt really cool. Like it was just me and like Mark Gunther, who's not with us anymore. He used to shoot mm. all the, all the big stuff on the road. He used to shoot Tour de France and stuff like that. And um, oh, I couldn't even tell you who who might have been there. Maybe Breachy might have. Damien Breach might have been there. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not sure. But yeah. I shot film until 2009. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I never got a the first digital camera I bought was I was like, it has to be full frame because what's mm. the point of getting a, a digital camera that's going to be worse quality than than film? Mm. And yeah, it just had to be a good quality camera. And I think the first one I got was a Nikon D700 back in 2009. Yeah, sick. Yeah. It had been out for a couple of years, but yeah. I can't remember. It was maybe 14 megapixels, probably <laughs> four or five frames a second. But yeah, it was it was sick. That was I shot that shot with that camera for probably nearly 10 years, I reckon. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, it was a beautiful camera. But yeah, I guess getting back to the the schedule, what I'd usually do, I'm sh- you know, you'd shoot two or three thousand photos a day. Probably you know, I'd get up try and get to practice every day, especially downhill practice, just to make sure you get photos of mm. everyone because you never know what's going to happen in downhill. Like people crash, people get injured, they might not qualify, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That happens to me all the time. So like um, when at Mont saint Anne this year, Connor Fearon, he only rode one day and I got yeah. – I think I got two really cool photos of him. I'm like, sick, this is great. Connor's done. Like, I, I think I nailed everyone that I wanted to get on that practice day because it was just Mont Saint Anne. The the uplift is so quick, and the track's tricky, but it's not like there was nothing much that was new. So everyone was just pumping out laps mm-hmm. quite quite regularly. So yeah, you would nail those. And then, so you'd get up, shoot early practice. It would start at eight o'clock, sometimes nine o'clock and shoot B practice. And then A practice would come on at like midday, shoot that. And that would go to like five o'clock. So that's, that's a full Mm. day shooting on a practice day. And then maybe there might be a race that night. So like, um, like a Friday you'd have practice, then qualities, which Mm. would go all, it would go all day. Qualities would finish at like four, four thirty. And then you would have the short track at like 5.30. Yeah. So you'd be shooting from 5.30 till 6.30, 7 o'clock, get back to your accommodation. And in one second, it was half an hour away. So I'd get home 8 o'clock. Oh, I haven't eaten in about eight hours. Probably should get some dinner. <laughs> so yep. It's really cool with me and Leanne because Leanne, she's just like my angel when it comes to a World Cup because she does all the food prep, gets my lunches ready, it's it's sick. It's like having a little slave almost. And then she'll <laughs> she'll go and find dinner, like go and get a pizza or cook some dinner. Or and I, as soon as I get home, I'm just on the computer putting putting all the photos on there. I used to actually sit on a couch. Like I'd fall asleep so often. I'd sit on a couch with my camera and I'd flick through all the photos on the camera 
Yeah. And anything that was blurry, I would just delete. And anything that was like, oh, I'm not going to use that, I would just delete it. So I'd yeah. go from like 3,000 photos to like I'd only upload actually about six or 700. Yeah. But it would take forever because I'm on this tiny little screen and I have to zoom in on every photo. But yeah, I just that sounds like pull, hell. I didn't want to pull all these all these photos that I'm never going to, like literally I'm never going to use on the computer, on the hard drives because it's mm. just just such a waste of space. But it just took it just took forever. It took like it literally would take two hours to sit there and look at the screen, and I'd be sitting there down there looking like this at this stupid little screen, and sometimes I'd just fall asleep and I'd just wake up and oh fuck, I've, I've got to do something. So I'd go for a <laughs> run around the block or go and get a Red Bull or something. So I've stopped doing that now. I'm just like, if I get the chance when I'm on the side of the track, like a little a little gap in between practice. There's usually mm-hmm. like. 15, 20 minute gap between like classes. So you'll have the juniors come through and then there's a 10, 15 minute gap and I'll sit there and I'll just quickly delete anything that's blurry just to get rid yeah. of like hundred photos. But I don't do it when I get back to the accommodation anymore because it's just so time consuming. Yeah. That so actually no sounds like hell. Oh, it like, is. There's no way I could do that. It, it was, it made it, it did kind of make sense to me because I'd, I'd upload everything and I'd seen everything and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to use that one. I'm going to use this one for that. I'm going to use this one for this client. I'm going to use, like, I would kind of know where the photos was and who was, what, what, what I was going to send to who. So that kind of made sense. But then at, I only really stopped that this year. Now I just put everything on the computer. <laughs> yeah. But it, up, just upload, like, plugging the camera into the computer and uploading, it'll take, like... 20 minutes to just mm. upload everything. And I'm like, well, I'll go and have a shower. I'll go and get something to eat while that's happening. And then, yeah, you're just on the computer until you, till you're done. <laughs> like, I think I'd probably spend about five or six hours, maybe mm-hmm. a bit longer sometimes on the computer. So you'd get to bed at one o'clock, two o'clock. So I think sometimes I've been to bed at like four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, one of the nationals that we had in Bright, I got, to, I was sending photos out at 4.45 in the morning. I was like, yep, that's done. Get to bed, get up, go again at 8 o'clock the next day. Um, yeah. I've got is that, what, is that yeah. worse now that people want it like straight away? Or has it's it always, always been that way for me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's always been that way. When I was shooting it was good the first first couple of years really like i shot for daniel 24 7 at Cairns, and he only wanted five photos mm-hmm. in exchange for the photo bib i wasn't getting paid i just got the bib and i was like yeah, yeah. this is sick. I'm, I'm living the dream i'm in the i'm in the b zone i'm not in the crowds <laughs> and he only wanted five photos then i'm like oh that's a really good trade i'll i'll take that any day of the week yeah and ever since then it's just it's just escalated. Like I'll have to send. So if I'm shooting for Oz cycling, I'll send like 50 to to a hundred photos depending on the day. Mm-hmm. And they, they're really good. They only want those just that night. So they can post stuff in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike at AMB, he wants everything that night. So he can post stuff like straight away, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. But yeah, it's it's tight for me, like especially on those. Um, I think I'm a little bit more. I don't know. I think I'm a little bit more anal when it comes to editing photos and sending stuff out. It takes me a little bit longer than kind of a lot of the Aussie other other Aussie guys. Mm-hmm. I think I don't know what it is. If it's just my old, like I, I still use Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom. Because I just haven't had time to learn it, mm. um, and I, when I look at my photos that I'm going to edit, I use Bridge, which is yeah. kind of like you're basically just looking at photos and you get all the metadata and all that stuff. But when you like, when I, I only look at it to see if it's sharp. That's literally almost the only thing I use in Bridge. Yeah, but when you click on the look like something click on like a writer's face to see if it's sharp. It takes like two seconds for it to load that Mm -hmm. 100% visual. So every time you do that, it's two seconds. And the time 
it really builds up over time. Yeah. Especially when you're looking at a thousand photos, it's two thousand, you know, yeah. two or three thousand seconds. I don't know what that is in in time, but yeah, it adds yeah. up. Um, whereas a lot of the guys these days are using a a, a software called Photo Mechanic, which mm. does the same thing, but it's all this. It's like a, I don't actually don't know how it works, but everything is instant. Yeah. So you click on something and you want to see it 100%. It zooms right in and it's just instant. Yep, that sharp. Yep, that sharp. Um, apparently it's awesome. But yeah, it costs, I don't know what it costs. It's like 80 bucks a year or something. So, Which yeah. is, yeah, it's enough. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's another thing that I'd have to have to learn and outlay. And yeah. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the way that I, that I select my stuff and edit. And I, I really enjoy editing in Photoshop because it's I, you can do a lot more in Photoshop compared to Lightroom. But I reckon it, it does it better sometimes too. Like if I've got a shot that I really want to look good, then I'll always do it in Photoshop. Lightroom if I'm just banging stuff out. But, yeah, for some reason I've always found the algorithms to work better in Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I've always... I mean, because I've been I've been using Photoshop for twenty years, twenty one years. Yeah. So I'm, I know exactly how it works, and I know exactly what I want it to do. Um, and I feel like now I'm at a really good point. It actually took me about four years from doing this type of work to get my photos kind of exported to whoever I want it to go to to look the way that I want it to look like. Yeah. So, like, I'd get it to a point where I'd be like, yep, that looks good. That's fine. I'll send that off. And then, so I look at a photo from three years ago and I'm like, oh, that's really flat. That's really not saturated. It's, it looks terrible. Mm-hmm. And I'll edit that photo the way that I edit it now and it looks completely different. So, I think mm-hmm. I've gotten to a point now with, with doing this method that I'm really happy with how, everything that I send off, how it looks like it doesn't need to be edited again by the client or whatever. I'll check again in three years and we'll get yeah, on your we'll photos. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how happy you are because it won't. So, and then, so I'll do all this stuff on Photoshop. I'll finish at one or two in the morning and then I'll, I'll have the high res stuff that I'll send to the high res clients and I'll have the web stuff to send to the web clients, but I'll send all those web photos to my phone by Bluetooth. So it happens instantly. It's awesome. Mm. <laughs> so I can look at the photos on the phone because that's how people look at photos. They say they don't look at them on computers anymore. Yeah. So I'm like, well, it looks great on the computer, but then I'll send it to the phone and it, it looks flat or this, why does this look green? Like it's not supposed to be green. It's supposed to be blue. and it's yeah. kind of crazy. So that's another layer of editing that I'll that I'll do. Like I'll go to the phone and flick through every photo and I'll highlight ones that I'm like, oh, that's that needs editing again. So I'll go back onto the computer, edit it, send to my phone. And it, yeah, the time just keeps going and going and going. Mm. And then if I want to say enter a photo competition like the A and B photo awards. I'll sit on a photo for an hour. I'll just be on the yeah. computer. I'll get it to a point that I'm like, yeah, that looks great. I'll send it to my phone. I'll even send it to Instagram mm-hmm. and see if like the, like the Lux filter on Instagram changes it. Or yeah. if like, if I choose a filter that I sometimes I'll use a, a filter on Instagram. I'm like, if I use that filter, how does it look? Yeah. Um, and then I'll go like, okay, that can look better in the raw format that I've edited it. So I'll go back to the computer, edit it again, add some more purple, add some more saturation, mm-hmm. whatever, dodge and burn this a little bit more. And then I'll send it back to the phone, do it all again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It, sometimes it'll take two hours to, to edit one photo if I want to print it or send it off to a, for an award or, yeah. I thought I was the only one that did the photo, <laughs> the phone thing, but yeah, hundred percent. I'll even <laughs> I, when I have a good phone, one that's not smashed, or even a phone at the moment. I'll have Lightroom <laughs> on my phone, 
What happened to your phone? <laughs> it's in like, well, my last, I had three. So I have my normal phone, a backup and a backup. Yeah. And they're all dead. Um, <laughs> the iPhone SE that I had, which was bomb proof, ended up with just like the middle third of the screen left. Oh, wow. By the end of it. Like, so I was cutting my ears when I used it and stuff, but it's the only option I had. <laughs> <laughs> and it finally died. Like it lasted six months like that. And it finally died. But That's crazy. Um. Yeah, so I'm just waiting on my other phone to get back. Yeah. But I'll have Lightroom set up on there. Oh, so yeah. then I can at least tweak it a little bit and then send it back to my computer and see what it's like as well. Yeah. Oh, I've not done that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. But it I thought I was the only one that did that. No, no, <laughs> you've got it. Like, so every Instagram post that I do, I will so I'll have the the image that I've edited, maybe spent half an hour on whatever. I'll have it. I'll have it on my phone that I'll maybe I've, I would have got from Dropbox or whatever. And I'll every single photo that you see of mine on Instagram, I edit it in Photoshop on my phone. So it's a Photoshop yeah. app that I've got through the Creative Cloud subscription. I think it's like a fifteen dollar subscription that you get through through Adobe. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> so I'll edit that on Photoshop on my phone before sending it to Instagram because all the photos that I'll send to clients will be like either 1600 pixels wide or maybe 2000 if they want it a little bit higher. Yeah. And I'll send those off. But when you go to Instagram, the highest resolution that you can have is 1080 pixels wide. Mm-hmm. Otherwise they'll, they'll shrink it for you and it'll be less quality. It'll be desaturated. It'll just look like shit. Yeah. So, Every single, every everything I edit on my phone, I save as 1080 or 1070 just to be safe sometimes. Mm. And then, yeah, then I'll have those in my photo album that I'll send to Instagram. It's crazy, like, how many different things you have to have if you've got mm. one photo that wants to go to multiple places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like um, I learned a few months ago, like, any movie that's on Netflix has a different sound mixing for every different possible device it can be played on so that oh, it sounds no op- optimized for every- so for an ipad is different sound mixing to your tv yeah and they've done That's the same cool. thing with sound yeah that you're basically doing with your photos yeah yeah yeah, yeah never- it, it gets it gets tricky sometimes like so at, at worlds i was shooting for amb and oz cycling and I had a couple of other clients as well who were like just like friends of riders or families or whatever. Mm-hmm. But so I was cycling A and B, they almost like A and B is all editorial stuff. So you want to try and tell a story. And then I was cycling is basically all the Australian riders that you mm-hmm. can get. But <clears throat> they, I was cycling, they want to do an article every day as well. So they want to kind of mm. tell us not, they don't want to tell as much as a story as Mike would do, but they still want to tell a story of how this, say how, how did Remy get second? You know, mm. I want to see his bike. I want to see his race run. I want to see what gear he's using. And I want to see him with the medal and him on the podium. And mm. they both want that. Both those clients want that. And you're like, how, like I, I never send the same photo to each client you can't can you really like well i mean you can but you you, you're not making that client feel special then are you like no if you're sending the same photo to two two people like they're paying me good money like and i'm you know just giving them the same photos that i've given this client or given Mm. this person for free you know so yeah it, it got that was the first time i'd shot for two kind of big clients at, a, at an event when they kind of wanted the same thing. It was good when it was like not Aussies, like obviously every French writer and every European writer and American writer, I would just kind of wanted the same thing. But, yeah, it was good. It worked out good. <laughs> yeah, definitely did. Um, what was it like? Uh, I guess you mentioned like you got to shoot the story, which is something I'm pretty big on trying to do at every event. Yeah. So like pits, bike kit you know getting the whole vibe 
down, yeah. it's such a hard thing to do. Do you, how did you kind of refine that? And do you need? Oh, story, story is my thing. I love, I yeah. love, I love telling a story. I love the emotion. I love everything about the event and the lead up to it. And as you say, like, I'm not, it's funny because I'm not that big into tech stuff. So I've never mm. really been into bike checks. Um, Worlds is different because all the bikes look really cool and they're all really yeah. unique. But I've never really been like, oh, that's a new derailleur. Like, cool. Like, it's not me like, at all. Yeah, okay. I've always been about the races and what's going on in their heads and, yeah, trying to capture that. It's it's kind of hard with, with downhill because they got the full faces on. Um, cross country is a lot easier because you can see – you can see the pain on their face, like going up mm. a climb, or that you can see, like the like Jared Graves' blood on his eyes and his glasses <laughs> are all crooked. Like you can yeah. see that there's something going on there. It's a lot harder to do that with downhill, which is why I love shooting the finish line <clears throat> corral for like the mm. last the last few riders, just to see the emotion and the celebration and the the heartbreak. Like that's mm. yeah, that I think. Sven was kind of the first guy to, to do that, actually. Um, I'd agree. Yeah. Way way back in the day, I think he, I don't know if he had it like an injury or something, he had like a broken ankle or something, and he he couldn't go and shoot the hill, so he just shot the finish line. Mm. Um, I think this is how the story goes. And, yeah, it was sick because it was like everyone was like, oh, you got all these awesome photos of the riders celebrating and no one else had those. And now that's what everyone does because – that's that's what people want to see. They want to see mm. the story. And yeah, um it was funny this year at Worlds. Oh my God. When Amory crossed the line, he was the last rider. And <laughs> so we're all standing there. We're in the B zone. Half of the B zone had got eliminated because the crowd just moved in and they just got rid of the tape. Yeah. So around that last corner, you couldn't you couldn't stand there as a photographer. You would have been on the track. So we all were, we were all standing at the finish line. There was like twenty of us, and then there was the guys down the bottom who kind of they would have got the best shots because they were already at the bottom. They didn't have to deal with the crowd. But we all, as soon as, as literally as soon as Amory crossed the line, we all ran after him. There was six police officers there who were trying to stop the crowd from coming in. Six six police officers. It's ridiculous. I went up to him and said, "Good luck," and yeah. <laughs> it didn't happen. Like we're all we're all running, and it's this. So the bottom of the is like it looks fine, like it's this beautiful grassy thing. But no, it's brute. There's big rocks and holes everywhere at at the finish line. It's the shittest finish line ever. You can't see anything. So we're all running. We've got these big packs on. One of the cops like tried to stop me, he pushes me out of the way, and I've fucking taken out this guy next to me as we're running down <laughs> to try and get Loic celebrating on the podium. He was probably about 50 meters away. We all run down. I had the camera up, and as soon as I got the camera up, like once someone let a flare off in front of me, the crowd was right behind us, like a thousand people just right behind us. Someone let a flare off, and my camera was capturing the flare because it was so bright. And it was yeah. literally right where Loic was. And I couldn't move. There was just people everywhere. So I didn't get one photo of Loic celebrating on the podium. And you see some like I think uh, Mad Dog Boris's this photo of him mm. with arms up in the air in the crowd, the French, the flares going off. Like it's all time. It's such a great photo. Like it tells a story. So good. And that that's the kind of photo that I'm like, a dr- that's a dream for me to get that photo. And that's how hard it is to get. You can't even get it because the freaking crowd comes in and blocks everyone and you can't even get to the finish. But, yeah, I, it, I was it was still awesome. I was literally watching that and I'm like, I want to be there getting that photo. Like, <laughs> I'm like, there is nowhere this is ever going to happen like that. Like, again, I don't yeah. think. I spoke to Sven afterwards. I said, have you ever seen a finish line corral like that is just like, so the last time when Amory won there, he said it was like that, but this time it was just on steroids. Like it was, it was insane. He had a big cut on him. I got a, I got a cut leg from something. I don't know what happened. He had a cut on his face 
So it must have been from his camera or something. And he was wrestling with the police. To yeah, get I saw the video got. for that. Oh, my God. And, yeah, we're all just desperate to get that photo. And usually it's it's hard just with all the other photographers. There's mm. like 20 or at the downhill, there's like 25, 30 photographers that are all trying to get a photo of the winner. Yeah. And usually it's really difficult to get a, a good photo. But when there's like 2,000 people there, it's, it's just, yeah. It's it's impossible. Well, it was impossible for me because I was too slow. <laughs> <laughs> Even those photos of the guys getting like carried off in their police escort, aka the golf cart, and them on the roof, yeah, yeah. like just seeing all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, it was, and it, you know what? It was there was a couple of like mob mentality people there. There was probably like mm. you know fifty of them. They, I saw them when um, so like people like. Aaron Gwynn were coming down and Dakota Norton, they're like 19th and 20th, the last to come down. And this crew of about 50 people are just walking down the track with like a big drum, <laughs> with chainsaws, and they're all like, they've got a big boom box going. It was really cool, but you could tell that they were just going to be the mischief makers and that they were, they had this pirate flag going. Oh, and <laughs> they were the ones that, just swarmed the finish line. Everyone chased after him. So there was like those crew and then, but everyone else that I saw in the finish line, like I was I'm like, oh, I can't get a photo of Loic. I'm just going to put a fish eye on and capture the crowd. And everyone that I went up, that I was kind of in front of were like, just like, it was almost tears of joy and mm. happiness and people hugging each other and high-fiving. Like it was actual genuine, like, I don't know, their team had won the grand final. That's the kind of feeling it was. It wasn't mm. just kids being assholes. It was like pure joy of these people. It was really it was really cool to be a part of, actually. I guess it's such a big sport there, right? Like it, oh, yeah. they start at such a young age, racing XC, doing trials, doing everything until what they're 16 and then they're allowed to ride downhill. Yeah. It's it's like, an, it's another it's another realm over there. And you, you can really see it when you're at an event like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so we're there on, I, I think Fletcher got there. He was there on Monday and Tuesday. I didn't get there until Tuesday afternoon. But when I got there on Tuesday, like it's, it's the middle of the week. You're in this tiny little village. And there was like thousands of people walking around this mm. village like the size of like it's there's probably a thousand permanent res- residents there and there's just thousands of people walking around and i'm like this is insane like it's <laughs> it's tuesday there's no yeah. racing it's just there's not even any downhill practice on yet and it was just this vibe there it was like they love it it's insane it's, i think that was the catalyst for me was to go there was like, yeah, world champs in France. It only happens every what 15 years. I think I can't remember the last time it was there. Mm, Okay. Um, you have just got to go. Like it's, I I just had to, I just had to go. I always, I mean, I've always tried to shoot world champs every, when I can, I've shot Mm -hmm. four of them now because it is just, it's just the pinnacle for me. I think the pinnacle of our, of our, of our, of downhill, especially. Yeah. How can you for Fort William then, where it's going to well, be everything? <laughs> to be honest, I don't, I don't know if I'm a, it'll still be sick. Like, I'm not a fan of them separating downhill from cross country at different venues and at different okay. times. I, I don't know. I just feel like it takes away from the whole, vibe of of mountain biking and mm. world champs like it's i think fort william's going to be sick regardless but yeah that the the cross country being in glasgow i don't know how far away how far away it is but yeah it's at a different time different venue and then there's marathon worlds at the same time there's mm. somewhere every like, worlds like yeah bmx road yeah. it's Definitely it's a only, It goes for two weeks, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. It's like the Olympics of cycling. Yeah. And I feel like they've done this, they've done the same this year with um with our national champs. It's mm-hmm. going for 12 days or something. I'm less like 10. Yeah. It's crazy. Like it's cool for 
kind of like I I'm, I was I, uh, this got announced today the national champs mm. at Threadbow, which is gonna it's gonna be sick. It's a perfect venue for downhill for pump track for cross country. I don't know. They haven't really had a good cross country race there for many many years, so I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, I don't know either. We I didn't even know there was cross country there. Yeah, they they. <laughs> I've done a, a little lap there. It's not, it's, yeah, they, they're going to have to do something, mm-hmm. build something. I don't know how it's going to work, but, yeah, we'll find out. They've got a bit of time to to work something out. Four months, I think. Mm. Five months, yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be cool to see it as a part of a festival as well, though. Like there's going to yeah. be your general crew that are just going there for Cannibal, so it's going to be just bigger, I yeah. think. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't. I, I think it's going to be a sick event, regardless. But yeah. I really think Cannonball could evolve a little bit more instead of having those those two, like the Alpine Assault and the Flow Motion Cup or whatever. They're basically just like two little downhill races on enduro bikes. Mm. I think they should just, in my opinion, they should just scrap those and just have an enduro race. With mm. maybe maybe lift assisted enduro, I think they should do all those and have a maybe even do like the the valley trail down to down to Jindabyne as a stage or something. I think that'd be a sick event. That'd um, actually be pretty rad. Like a we call them down juros here because it's not, yeah yeah where it's literally you just get lift assisted yeah stages and you have multiple times yeah like a full king of the mountain style yeah I I don't I don't know it's that. that this they're, they're great for racing i think those events are really cool <coughs> to race but to mm. shoot especially like the alpine assault which just goes down under the chairlift like you shoot one corner you've shot every single corner on this on the, on that race like it's <laughs> such a boring race to shoot i'm sorry <laughs> to, to thread on that but yeah. it's a sick it's event so- but it's it's so shit to shoot I, I i can't i can't like when i shot it one year I don't even know how I shot it for. Um, Gravity down under when they were still around. Um, I just got bored and I just went and shot downhill practice. Like it was the race was on and I'm like, this is, I'm mm. shooting the same corners after and after. Like it's a sick exactly. trail to ride. I love, I love riding both those those trails that they race. They're sick fun to ride, but to shoot is just, <laughs> yeah, it's so boring. 100%. So, like I kept forgetting where I was, like what photo was what because they all look the same. <laughs> it's so weird. Um, but a downhill track sick. It's a sick track to shoot. Um mm. it's easy to get around. Um yeah. I don't know how it's gonna be with a big crowd, but yeah, maybe the crowds are always they're always pretty big down the bottom. But it's it's always been good access for us at Threadbow too. Like mm-hmm. we get we get lift access, the bottom's always pretty well bunted off for us. So mm. Yeah, it's it's a sick place for for an event. I think I think it's going to be good. I just I I'm just not a fan of those those down duro races. I just think they should get rid of them and have something better. Mm. Um, whip off sick pump tracks great. I think pump track has really evolved there to be a really good event. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a sick event. But geez, ten like I'll probably have to get there Tuesday Wednesday. And I'll be there for like 15 days just to shoot, just to shoot nationals. It's it's crazy to me. Yeah, I'm low key stoked. I don't shoot XC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I uh, I don't even know if I can go with the timing it is anyway because of yeah. work. But yeah, trying <laughs> to get 10 or 15 days off to go and shoot is impossible. Yeah, yeah. It's I don't know. It, it's going to be it's sick. it's a great idea. I don't know how many like a lot of the cross country people they'll just go there for their week and they'll go home. There'll be a few people who will stick around to do to do the flow motion cup and that. But um, I don't even know what that if that's called that any anymore. But yeah, I and, can't remember. And track like you know Ryan Gilchrist, so Zoe Cuthbert, they'll they'll stick around for the whole time. All those mm-hmm. types of riders. Um, but yeah, I think. It's a similar thing with worlds next year. I don't know if I'm if I'm gonna go. I don't know if I'm if I'm keen. Like, I don't know. We'll see. 
it's in August. There's no other races in August next year or in July even. Like there's a whole two months off of the World Cup. Set. Yeah. It's it's kind of weird. I don't know why they why they've done that. But yeah, they've just gotten rid of the two best months to ride in for the World Cup. It's kind of strange. Yeah, um, I know. And they don't start till June. Like it's yeah. it's such a weird schedule. Yeah. I think in, I don't know. I I read a comment the other day that someone thought it might. Obviously, Worlds is on, and it goes for two weeks, and there's a lot of build up for that, and a lot of aftermath as well. And then there's the Tour de France, and I'm like, oh, maybe Discovery have to be around mm. for the Tour de France or something, which goes for three weeks in the middle of July. So I, I thought that might have been a contributing factor to them not having any World Cups or AWS or anything. That kind July. of makes sense. It's yes, yeah, it's, it's it's weird. It's the best time to race, but yeah, yeah, no races. And Mont Saint Anne in October, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard rumors like it's the worst time to yeah. ride Mont Saint Anne. We'll have to look at some uh, some some footage from riders in the next few weeks to see what it's like. <laughs> yeah. It is good, like I guess for me, in saying like it's fifteen days to be away, but at least it's condensed. Like that two and a half weeks of Threadbow to Medina last year was brutal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would have been not, I, I decided not to go to Cannonball last year. Um I, I, don't, I don't know. I've shot Cannonball two two times and I really enjoy it. And I enjoy the the festival vibe. And I really like especially like the pump track, like everyone's just around the track and just having a good time and there's, you know, really top level racing there and the whip off sick. It's that sunset. It's just a, it's a cool, it's a cool festival, but mm. it's like if you're into like music festivals, going to going to music festivals, yeah. just to see all, you know, the bands that you might be into, but you're going there for that festival vibe. I've never really been like that. I've always okay. been super. So if I want to see a band, I'm going to go to a, a, a show at the Corner Hotel or whatever just because I want yeah. to see that band. I want to get that proper experience of them mm. playing for two or three hours instead of playing for 45 minutes at a festival. I've never... I don't know, people, people, I just can't do people, man. <laughs> yeah. It sounds it sounds so weird because I surround myself at those events with thousands of people, but it's always the pinnacle of, of the sport, World Cups and World Champs. It's always the best of the best. Whereas Cannonball for me, like you get some top-level races there, but you don't get all of them. Mm. Um, whereas this year, obviously it's going to be different. Everyone's going to be there. I but, think yeah. last year was used as a very good warm up for nationals. So there was quite a few fast riders there. Yeah. And, but yeah, I get what you're saying for sure. Um, and, and just like, I'll probably go, I'll shoot the cross country and then I'll have like four days off and I won't, I won't shoot the, the, uh, the like all the other little events that they have and I'll yes. come back for pump track and then shoot the downhill. But yeah. Those little events are just, I mean, they're cool. They're, they're great events. I love those trails. I love riding them. I'd, I'd love to race them, but, yeah, shooting them is just not. Nah, it's, it's not great. Yeah. Hopefully for pump track this year, it's no chains and it's head-to-head. Chains, <laughs> should, be, chains should be banned in pump track nationals. Yeah, just saying. Out there. What was the track like last year? I didn't see the new one. Track was sick. Yeah, it looked good. The whole vibe there was sick. Yeah. And, like, they were hooking and it looks like it was very, like a trustable track. Yeah, there wasn't like going to be any near death experiences or anything. Yeah, nice. And it's a bit longer than Medina, I think. But yeah, it was a really, really good track yeah. and a really, really good vibe overall. Nice. Yeah. Speaking of pump tracks, we we here at Mount Beauty are getting a new pump track. I think it'll be ready. Probably in autumn. I think maybe maybe a bit earlier. Yes, it, it's it's going to be huge. It's going to be it's put being put out to tender. I can't I can't remember how much money we got. Like one hundred and fifty, maybe two hundred grand mm-hmm. to build a pump track. So yeah, it's being put out to tender. We haven't they haven't selected who's going to build it yet, but it's 
going to be so good. It's going to be yeah. that whole. So it's at the BMX track in town. So there's going to be like half a BMX track, which they might refurbish as well with some of the money. Mm-hmm. And then the pump track and then the skate park, with, which has got the new bowl. So it's going to be mint in Mount Beauty next year with uh, with what's going on down here. Is there much like trail development and stuff happening throughout that area? At well, the with the new, so back in the day, Mount Beauty, not back in the day, like three years ago, there was almost a new track popping up in Mount Beauty every year. Mm-hmm. But we, the club, Team Mount Beauty did a, um, they had to do, I, don't, I can't remember why they did it. They might have had to get a grant or something to do, to build a, to build a new shelter or something. Mm-hmm. And they had discovered that the track, the, a lot of the um, trails actually aren't on AGL land, which we, we managed to park for AGL and they, they really, they were really flexible with us to do anything we wanted in the park in the mm-hmm. past. But then we found out that Delp, so the, the government had some of the park as well on their land, mm-hmm. which we, which yeah. nobody knew. Like the government didn't even know that they had that land. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> after we told them, after we found, I don't know how we found out. It's really weird too. Cause the map, like AGL's got the where obviously where all the power lines go up the hill and and stuff like that, but the line where it is just doesn't make sense. It's, yeah. it's kind of weird where the where the land changes. It's not really well defined. So anyway, after we just discovered that, the government's like, oh, every, we'll have to go into an agreement with you about how we manage the land and all this stuff. It kind of turned into what Warburton's turned into, but yeah. not quite as dramatic. So basically, they've said. If you want to build a new track, it has to go through an audit. It has to be planned out. It has to be, we have to eliminate an old track to build a new track. Okay. So the, park, the park actually can't grow. It's just got to evolve. Um, there's a couple of other rules in there as well. But so we haven't actually had any new trails being built in Mount Beauty for a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of good. We've gone into a lot of refurbing all the old tracks. Like there's trails mm. in that video that are 30 years old. Yeah. And they're, they're awesome. But, yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're fixing those up, getting them all done. The shelter's all done, which is sick. There's a whole, there's a whole bar- new barbecue zone down there now. The showers, I think, work now. So they can get, <laughs> get good. a nice shower yeah. there. There's a sick new bike wash. The car park's getting all redone, so it's all going to be asphalt now, which is going to yeah. be. Sick. So yeah, it's 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 a really cool. It's always been a really cool spot for a race for a venue, but it's just getting better and better every year. Um, and we get super lucky with the downhill as well because most of the downhill tracks, not that, not that it should make a difference. They're mostly on AGL land, so if yeah. we need to make changes. We kind of can. We're not supposed to, but we kind of can be like, oh, that section's too dangerous. We'll just get rid of it and build yeah. a new section around it. And so we kind of got this little gray area where we can change stuff, which is what we did last year for the Vic, the Vic round. We we yeah. cut it, we closed off some old sections and built some new stuff or scratched in some stuff through the forest. So yeah. It's so funny how like the government didn't even know they own the land, but as soon as they do, it's just all these rules. Yeah, we kind just- of <laughs> we kind of kicked ourselves in the in the feet there because <clears throat> there was there was one one dude in particular who's built he would have built seventy percent of the park over the last thirty years. He was the actually the track designer for the Sydney Olympics back in two thousand. So he's built. 75% of our mountain bike park. And every every winter he would go out and dig a new trail, like a, a kilometer long trail. And he would just dig it by hand every winter. And then when we come into spring, we'd have a new track to ride. And yeah, we can't do that anymore. So mm. yeah. He he does still go out there, but yeah. We we don't know where his tracks are. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that around here. Oh, sure. yeah. <clears throat> It seems so hard in Vic just to get trails. Like, obviously, I put a post up about Red Hill. Yeah. And like how the entries were capped and stuff. 
which I got a lot of feedback from, some positive. Oh. But, like, I didn't, like, shout out to Andrew Howison and stuff for yeah. teaching me a lot, I guess. I'd learned a lot, but I didn't realise, like, how hard it is for you guys to get tracks and to have yeah. tracks and hold races. Like, it seems ridiculous. Yeah. Being going and ride a moto anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, you should, I mean, the, the amount of, we live in a really awesome place for if you want to go for a moto ride, there's so much up here. Like it's insane. And we're super lucky with our mountain bike, what we've established here over the last 20 years. We've got beauty. We've got bright, we've got falls Creek, which have got new trails coming this summer. Oh, sick. Yep. And it's all, it's all half an hour away from where we are. So it's insane. We've got 200 kilometers of, of trail about 150 of them are hand cut. So it's all old school, awesome. Yeah, good and, stuff. Yeah, it's just, it's awesome. Um, Falls Creek are really cool because they, they go, they're really good at going through all that permission stuff and getting everything sorted. They've, they've got it on lock and they've got the people behind them and the money mm. behind them to, to do that stuff. Whereas Brighton Mount Beauty, we don't, we don't have that. We've got volunteers and that's it. So, yeah. Yeah. There's no, it's, it's like everywhere else, I guess, but yeah, mm. we've had that history here that has really helped us. There's not much commercialized bike park or outside of like Medina, maybe Blue Derby, Threadpo. There's not like that many commercialized serious mm. bike parks in Renault's, which I've always found weird. Mm, yeah. It must be so hard though. Yeah, Especially I don't want to do it. Because <laughs> where, where all the cool mountains are, there's national parks, there's government, there's you know, other land managers, like the crazy stuff they've got going on in Bright with the land manager there. It's mm. just uh, the plantation. Who knows what's going to happen in, in 2024 with, with Bright. They might not even be there in in a year and a half. So we'll see. It's, yeah, crazy time. Crazy to see stuff just get wiped out. But it always, it's weird because, like, we had Fox Creek burn down here. Yep. Two years ago, it completely wiped out the park, completely gone. But then we just saw new parks and new spots pop up. Yeah, right. And they just worked. And forestry's like, well, you've lost one. You can have another one here and a smaller one there. And yeah, we actually ended up now Fox is back. We've actually ended up with more riding areas than just losing <laughs> one. <laughs> so we're super lucky. And I think that. We kind of forget that sometimes yeah. when I learn about not, Melbourne. I've not ridden in that part of the world, to be honest. I've, um, you know, I, I think I raced BMX there back in the day in the late 90s, but yeah, I've never, never mountain biked in Adelaide. Yeah. Yeah, right. Not, yeah. It's pretty sick. Yeah. Everything I've seen lately, especially all the new Foss Creek stuff coming out and everything that Connor puts up just looks sick. <laughs> Yeah, but that it's that's Connor, Connor though. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good because everything's within an hour of the airport. Yeah, like yeah. literally any trail you point at. So I'm looking across the valley at the moment at a bunch of like the ridge, the main ridge of Adelaide. Yeah, and you can pretty much like there's trails all the way along it. So you can do a 90k ride here pretty much on mountain bike trails. That's so sick that it's like, as you said, like it's so close to the city. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool. But we don't have the Alps. <laughs> we yeah, don't have the cool. high country. Like yeah. A run here is three minutes. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's still good. It's, it's hard to get, especially a downhill track, longer than than three minutes in Australia, really. I mean, Medina's obviously got it. Redbow, uh, where else? Bright. Mm. But yeah, who knows what's going to happen in Bright? I feel like Bright. Um, I mean, they've got their two downhill tracks there. One of them's a lot shorter though. But yeah, I feel like that that Mystic downhill's really worn out, and it yeah needs it had it actually had some some changes to it because of the logging. A lot of it kind of got yeah okay. Taken out. Um, but yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah. I remember like 2019 nationals that looked like it was going to kill a few people. Yeah. Yeah. And then it got worse after that. Right. It's crazy because it's, I mean, they have, uh, nationals is crazy because you get so many people doing so many runs. But when you go to a World Cup, you think that you know 
as especially as a photographer, like walking down Bright and walking down Medina, it's hard work, but it's not like it's not steep compared to Europe. Mm-hmm. And even Mont Saint Anne is quite steep in places too. But like walking down Leger, you I didn't understand how like it, it just gives that um that thing where everything looks flatter on TV. It doesn't look that steep on TV. And it it is so much steeper over there mm. in Europe than than anything. It's even at Lenzerhide. Like Lenzerhide just looks just so boring to ride, but it is so steep. There's they've got yeah. all those corners up the top for a reason because you can't get down otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, <sighs> I it's think it was lot. like uh, the day after, just after practice, that uh, track walk had finished. I got a message from Fletcher and he's like, I'm never going to complain about walking down a track in <laughs> <Yeah>. Australia <laughs> ever again. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. It was awesome shooting with, with Fletcher. We didn't actually get that much time to hang out because he was staying in Morzine, which which kind of sucked because it would have been sick if we were kind of both in Leger because getting back to Morzine was so much, it sounded like so much work to me, like waiting mm. at the bus stop at a certain time, taking half an hour on the bus. Like I'd fall asleep in that on that bus mm. ride. You'd get back and like, oh, I've got to eat. I've got to edit. Anyway, but it was sick hanging out with Fletcher that week. And, yeah, we, we never really shot at the same spot. It was really, oh, no, it was cool. We were shooting for the same client too, so. Yeah, mm. it was it was a sick week, but yeah, every time I saw him, he was just like, "I'm I'm done. I'm cooked. I can't do this. <laughs> my, my legs are sore. My back's sore." And I'm like, "Dude, you need to train. You need to train for these races." <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's crazy. Well, I, I've, it's sick where I am here. Like I've got, I'm looking out at Mount Bogong now, which is two thousand meters high, and the hike up to it is well, it's just under two thousand, but the hike up to it is like a 1500 meter climb and it's just go straight up. Yeah. It's called the staircase spur and it's such good training to, to go. <laughs> you, you ride, you can ride out to the bottom of it and then you just go straight up and it's, yeah. only, it's six K to the summit from, from the bottom and it's just 1500 meters vert. So yeah, yeah. perfect training to, to hike with a big, with a big pack on. <laughs> it's got to laps. Yeah. What was it? What's it like seeing so many new photographers and, and people coming out of the woodwork at the moment? Like, yeah. I, I, I've it's seen good. a fair few. It's different, actually. It's good. Um, I mean, I've been, as I said earlier, I've been shooting people riding bikes for 20 years now. Mm. Um, and I've been kind of pretty pretty lucky with my clients the last five years to be able to, I don't know, make I, like I couldn't make a living off it. I kind of have chose not to, to be honest, because um, I don't want to get burnt out by just mm-hmm. taking photos all the time. So I really do actually say no a lot to photography work um, just because I don't want to take photos of stuff I don't want to take photos of. Mm. So I'm, I'm really lucky there that I've, I get to go to all the big events and I get some really cool clients like big, I've seen some new bikes that are coming out that no one's seen before, and I get to, you know, I get to ride them. Like I got to ride the new Stump Jumper last year before it came out, yeah. Or the year before, and it, you know, got to take photos of it and ride it. It was, it was sick. So I'm super lucky there. And seeing all, especially the young people coming through, um, it's cool. I really. I really like what they're doing and how they're going about it. A lot of them are not just going out there and taking photos and just giving them away. They're really kind of going out there trying to make a a business out of it, Mm -hmm. which is really cool because it's so, it's so hard to do um, Mm. to get clients and to make money. Like I know probably half a dozen 20 year olds, who are going out there and they're doing it the right way. They're going out there to, to, to try and make a living out of it. And they're not just giving their stuff away, which is really cool for me because if someone went to one of my clients and said, Oh, I can do this for this much, which is be probably half as much as what I would charge. I'm like, why are we going to get Matt to do this when this guy can do this for half as much? 
Mm. So it's cool that a lot of people, a lot of the kids aren't doing that, which is really cool. They're all, they're like, I've had so many people ask me, Oh, how much, how much do you charge for a day or how much do you charge for a photo or whatever? And I'll just tell them straight up, like, this is how much I charge or how much I ask for, for, for a day or for a client Mm. or for a week or whatever. And I'll just tell them, like, if you want to shoot and do this, this is how much you need to charge. And a lot of the time they're just like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. And I'm like, well, that's, that's, this is what you need to do to, to get by because you're only going to shoot two or maybe two or three days a week all summer if you're, if you're lucky mm. for cycling. Oh, 100%. Um, so it's only when you look at it on a calendar, it's literally you're going to be working 40 or 50 days for a whole year <laughs> if you get every yeah. single job that you want. So, yeah, you need to you need to charge accordingly, really. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's super cool. I've had like heaps of people who have got their first images published in magazines, and I've always had shout outs from them saying, "Oh, thanks for giving me contacts to this magazine and such and such." And you know, it's really cool. I love seeing people like people asking me on Instagram or how do I have, how do I do this? How do I do that? How much do I charge this? And then they get the result out of it mm. after, you know, a few months or, a, you know, a few weeks of, of persisting and, and yeah, getting stuff published or getting clients. It's cool. It's yeah. I'm really, I'm really stoked with the young crop of kids coming up in Australia. Mm. Um, There's yeah. no point in like shielding it or creating this boundary around that. Yeah. Like I, I think people think that's the way I think. Like it's almost like gang wars. Like yeah, this yeah. is Matt Russo's territory and these are his clients and, and whatnot. <laughs> and, you know, everyone's got their clients, but it's, sometimes it's good to share this around and, you know, yeah. get people shooting for magazines or shooting for clients and doing cool shit because yeah. it's more rewarding for me sometimes to see that happen. Oh, yeah. It's sick. Yeah. Although I do hate missing out on a, on a magazine cover. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was after the contents page of one magazine, but then it got used for an article because the guy writing the article wanted to do his thing. Yeah, I was yeah. a little bit devil about that because I don't know. I like <laughs> contents pages more than covers. Yeah. No. Oh. I'm that guy. Okay. <laughs> what? How many covers have you had? I've only had one. Well, really? I've only had one national publication. I've had a heap of local stuff. Yeah. Um around the area. Heap of heap of newspaper stuff. Um yeah. but yeah, only one magazine cover. Was that AMB? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a shot of uh Dean Lucas up yeah, in right. the store. Yeah. Yeah. Was, sick. I think a few years ago now. It was the year that he didn't go overseas because of COVID. Yeah, and okay. I can't remember what year it was. I think it was 20, 2020. 2020, yeah. And we went up. It, he was he was kind of umming and ahhing whether he wanted to go overseas, and we went up to Falls Creek and it puked down snow. It was like a super early snowfall. It was like March or something. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And it puked down snow, and we went up. I think the weekend after, and there was just all these awesome snowbanks everywhere on all the mountain bike trails. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we got to shoot a heap of cool snow photos. And it was, yeah, like he, he could ride on the mountain bike trail and then just bomb through a section of snow. And it, it was just perfect. Like it was the best. It was freezing cold, but, yeah, it was the best conditions for a really unique um, photo photo shoot. It's got to be rare in Oz to get yeah. that. Yeah. Super rare. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try and do it again this after the season ends because the snow season ends this weekend. Yeah. And then, yeah, we've got a couple of things in the woodwork to try and get some really cool, unique stuff up there going this. this yeah, sick. Yeah. Do you have a favourite photo or anything that kind of like you just remember? Uh, I've got I've got some cool memory photos, yeah, especially some, some of our stuff that we – because we did this mountain bike race in Nepal. I did it in 2015 and then – me, Leanne, and I both did it in 2016. And there's mm. some photos from that event that I think I took most of them that are just 
Like it's insane. Like they they were just on this little point and shoot camera that I brought mm-hmm. with me. Like I just had it in my little in my camel back. Um, it was like a Nathan backpack, like a running backpack. Yeah, I just had it here, sitting there on on, on my shoulder, so I could take photos and just stop and take photos because it was just you're in the Himalayas riding your bike in a race. Like it was just insane. There's a, there's a bunch of photos from that that are probably my all time favorites because just because it was the experience. Mm. obviously yeah there's there's a shot of of leanne riding up this that's just a road like a dirt road but in the background is like the eighth tallest mountain in the world and yeah, she's right. riding towards it and it's just yeah to me it's just all time i love it just more of those experiences yeah 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 it's if you're ever going to want to go mountain biking somewhere you need go to nepal it's yeah yeah the, then the 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 tours that they have there are insane. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, companies like Himalayan Single Track, they'll they'll get you on a plane, fly you up into the into the mountains, and then you just ride off from the airport, and you yeah. go up into this. It's like the world's deepest gorge. You've got Annapurna on one side, and then Dalaguri on the other side. They're two eight thousand meter mountains, and you just yeah. ride up this gorge in between them, and then yeah, it's yeah, it's sick. What about racing photos? Have you got anything like? Uh, not off the top of my head. It's nah. probably one of Loic because every world champs that I've shot, he's won. <laughs> 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 That's that right? I think it is. 17, 18, 19, and 22. I think that's right. Cairns, what was Lens Hyde? Did he win Lens Hyde? I can't remember. I think he did yeah, probably That's like right. he's, he's single, won like six out of the five Last every single five. world champs yeah. that i've shot he's won that's cool yeah, yeah. i put it down and, to you and hide once and and now leger so yeah that's it's pretty insane it's it definitely would be probably one of like winning one of those races i yeah. can't really yeah because he's such especially at the finish line he's such an emotional character as well Mm. Um, at Cairns, he had tears in his eyes, um, which was just yeah, it was all it, as as crap as it was. How he beat Mick, and it was such a sick race. How how he did, <laughs> how the French did, kind of over overcome Mick. Um, it's yeah, it was still really cool for him to win. It was, I think it was his first world level win. He didn't hadn't even won a World Cup yet. True, so was, yeah. that was really cool. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Not really. I I wouldn't really say any race action photos. I could say are some of my favorite photos. It's always been a res- like a result, a finish line photo. I reckon. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah. Do you, know. a, do you have a favorite rider to shoot? Oh, there's a few. Blanky's. Great to shoot. Mm. He's so he's just so dynamic. Um, Brendog also is every time. I don't know if Brendog's got this thing where he can see photographers down the track, and he'll <laughs> he'll yep. just do something like do a table or do a do a whip or something. Um, right in front of you every single time without fail. Sick. Um, yeah, that's pretty sick. Miriam the Cole actually is really sick to shoot because she's mm. super dynamic. Um, who else? From, oh, probably of the Aussie guys. I really like shooting Connor. Yeah, Dino's, that's a given. <laughs> Dino's weird. Connor's sick because he's so – the shit going on around him is just insane and he's just solid. He's just locked in, beat up. <laughs> I don't know if you like there's the corner if you, exploding or a rock going behind him or yeah, it's if, it's awesome. There's like a an old edit. Um, it's one of my favorite edits now for getting the the title of it. He did it for SRAM. Yeah. And it's in like Bellingham or something silly. And it just looks like his head's on a gimbal and everything else is happening around him. Yeah. And it's yeah, I, I completely understand what you mean. Yeah. But- Jackson Frew is actually pretty sick to shoot. He's he's like that a lot more. Mm-hmm. I think now that he's on a on a on that common style that he's on, I think he 
I don't know if he's just on, he's always been there and he's always been close to the top, but I don't know if he's always had the support that he's needed to win. And I think now that he's on a, on, a, on a really cool bike and he's just doing it for the love. Like obviously mm. he would love to get on a team or whatever, but I think everything, every time that I've seen him lately, he's just been like really happy to be riding and racing his mm. bike. Um, yeah. And it really comes across in in practice and in race runs. Yeah. He, he's, so I've got this photo. Actually, there's a photo from him at Leger and he's going around this corner that's not even a freaking corner. <laughs> this little rut that they were riding through and he's hovering above it, but he's turning at the same time. Both his wheels are off the ground. I was on this, I was in a, I, was, I had a fish eye on, so I was like, 20 centimetres away from him and both his wheels are off the ground and he's just hovering above this rut, but he's somehow turning at the same time to go left down to next, the next part of trail. That's actually really one. That was probably one of my favorite shots from worlds. I think that AMB used it on one of their cover shots of one of their stories. Um, but he just has this way of, of riding that, I don't know if he knows how close to the edge that he actually is. He doesn't. Yeah. It's completely out of his mind. He's yeah. always in control. Yeah, yeah. And I'm genuinely got like triple zero on my phone ready to call him <laughs> every time I watch him come past because it looks like he's about to die. And I think that's the mentality that those guys have, that they're just com- they're completely in control. When it To the outsider, to me, it... Like obviously, like ninety nine percent of the time, he probably is in one hundred percent control. But every time I've got a photo like that of him, it just looks like he's about to crash, and it's fucking awesome. But yeah, mm-hmm. and then you talk to him about it, and it's just like, what are you talking about? That was fine. <laughs> I I'm, I thought I was the only one because he always tells me tells me like, nah, I'm fine, and like yeah. it can't be that bad. I thought I was the only one that saw it, but I'm glad to hear <laughs> it's that. Not of, it's not like it doesn't look sketchy. It just <laughs> The stuff going on around him looks terrifying. But yeah. Just the, he, he has this eye for things that are just stupid and on the boundaries of human ability. <laughs> and he doesn't, but he doesn't realize how close he is to not doing it. And yeah. then, but that doesn't matter because he's done it. Like that's yeah, all that matters yeah, in yeah. his head is. Yeah. That once he's, he's got it unlocked, he's like, yeah, that's done. Next. Yeah. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, he's by far one of my favorite to shoot because you never know what's going to happen. Ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what's your favorite place to shoot in, in, in Oz? Do you have a favorite? Oh, what that's is a that? hard one. I don't, I mean, obviously I like shooting here, but that's just easy. Um, mm. And I know, I know it so well. It's not the most picturesque place to shoot here in Mount Beauty. Okay. Um, Falls Creek's sick to shoot just because it's up in the in the Alps, but that's also very easy. It's it's super easy to make that place look amazing. Mm-hmm. I've a lot of the. I mean, I'm going to say four, there's four trails that start above the tree line, mm-hmm. and when you look across the valley, you're looking at the tallest mountain in Victoria, and it it just like half the time it's snow capped as well. So it's really easy to make that place look sensational. Um, the riding at Falls Creek is not that great, to be honest, but, yeah. It just access, looks good. Yeah, it just looks great. Um, like I enjoy riding there, but it's not like a place I'm – it's not on my bucket list to go to go shred. But, yeah. Um, Tassie, you know what? I've, I've never really been a fan of machine-built trails. Yeah. Everything in Tassie that I've ridden has been machine built. Um, I'm sure there's definitely trails out there that that haven't been. I, and I was told when I went to say so I went to Derby, I really enjoyed riding Derby, and I'm like, it's just, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just not my type of riding. It, I just mm. feel like it's it's fast and it's fun and it, it's cool with a good crew, but it's not challenging to me. Mm. It's not, it doesn't scare me. Um, I'm sure there's trails that I haven't ridden. Like, um, I mean, look at that Trouty Trail and it's all the rocks and that. And that, that looks sick. I didn't actually get to ride that this time. 
when I was down there. I'd love to ride a trail like that. I think that would be sick. But um, Derby just didn't click for me. Medina doesn't click for me either. I just I think it's a cool idea and it's a cool concept and it's a really cool place, beautiful area. They've really hit the nail on the head of managing a park and doing it well and everything's awesome. But the trails, I, I just, yeah, no, nah, I just don't don't think I would, in, I mean, I would enjoy it, but I, it's not going to be on my bucket list to go. Mm. Um, there is some super, super tech stuff there though. Like, oh, I can imagine there would. What is there, like 200 Ks of trails there or something like that? Yeah, and like their tech stuff is proper tech. So yeah. I'll defend yeah. them on that point. But I yeah. hate seeing photos of the flow trails. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like yeah, I'd get that for sure. I think if I went there, I'd you know, and rode went there to ride, it would be sick. I would love it. But yeah, um, mm. I don't know. I think Cam. Yeah, I don't know. In Oz, I've been to a, I've been to a fair cool fair few cool places, but yeah. Newcastle, Cairns is pretty cool. The trails up in Cairns are amazing. There's a lot of really cool stuff, mm. really old stuff that Glenn and those guys have built and those girls have built. It's um, it's just stunning up there. Yeah, and, I think that's on the bucket list for the sure. Yeah, or not like Cairns itself, but everything around Cairns mm. is insane. I've done a little bit there. Um, the Blue Mountains, there's mm. some really cool, sneaky little tracks there that are just mind blowing as well. I don't know. I reckon, yeah. like, Northern Territory and like desert <laughs> stuff would be kind of unique. I've actually ridden there now that you say that. I've ridden, um, some of the stuff that they ride in that Outback Classic or whatever it's called, the Red Redback or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, but when when I was there, I was just looking up at those red sandy hills, and I'm like, I just want to go up there and just shred down one of those red sandy mountains. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's kind of illegal, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> when we we did we did probably like a hundred k's of riding there when I went there last in I don't know 2014 or something. Yeah. It was sick. It was good fun, but it was just pure cross country. Like you're just pedaling the whole time. There's no descents. There's nothing challenging. And I'm just looking up at these awesome sand mountains going, just that just looks like where the trail ends. Like, let's go up there. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like a protected Aboriginal historical site. <laughs> yeah. Not going to go ride that. Yeah. You're getting a lot of shit. I didn't oh, even know yeah. there was lawns, laws up there, but apparently there are. Um, might start wrapping things up a little bit as we're coming up to the two hour mark. I think it's going to be oh, one of our longest. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even feel like it. I know. It's just been chatting for, for so long. Um, I guess like what advice would you have to those crew that want to get into photography and, you know, travel the world, taking photos of mountain bikes and take yeah, it seriously. Um, I don't know. I think you just got to keep shooting, keep. When I first started, so for example, when I went and shot Cairns World Champs, I had a really good camera body, like it was pretty competitive. Mm. But the lenses I had were terrible. (laughs) They were cheap, plastic, no-name lenses. Um so I was shooting, so I was shooting the same spots as everyone. I was shooting, like I'm, I'm laying down in a ditch, shooting this sick corner next to Boris. And I'll get to, I'll get home that night. I'll look at Instagram and I'm like looking at the photo that I've taken. I don't even think Instagram was around back then. Anyway, I'm looking at the photo that I've taken and then I'm looking at the photo that Boris has taken and his is about 10 times sharper. Yeah. And I'm like, how we're in the same spot. We're doing the exact same thing. And it just gets to a point when you're taking photos that the gear really does start to matter. Mm. I think when you're starting out and you're just playing around with your mates and you're doing, you're doing stuff in the forest on the weekends, like it's, there's some really good gear out there and you can definitely get away with 
with doing that and entering competitions and, you know, maybe even doing event photography. Yeah. But if you want to go to the next step, you actually have to fork out a bit of money to, to get kind of recognized for you, for your images. Mm. Um, that's, that's one thing, just good glass, really good lenses, are the key. Um, even so I had a, I think Medina, the first time I shot Medina, I had a 70 to 200 Tamron lens, mm-hmm. 2.8, really good. It costs like two grand, two and a half grand or something. And I was shooting with it and I'm like, this is awesome. This is a really cool lens. And then <clears throat> I just started kind of, it wasn't getting the focus sharp as much as I wanted. So it was getting three or four sharp photos out of six or seven. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to fork out and get the ne- get the Nikon version of this lens. And it's actually the last version they released of that lens and that's probably the last one they'll ever do now that everything's gone mirrorless. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say it's the best full-frame DSLR 70 to 200 lens that you can buy. It would cost me, I think, three, three and a half, three, six or something for this lens. Yeah, right, yeah. And the difference is insane. So I'm getting six out of seven photos are sharp now. Just the tracking on it is so much better. Mm. And it is sharper. It is, yeah, everything about it is just better. It's more more durable, more weatherproof, sharper, faster, everything about it. Just that next level. It's so minuscule that only when you get to the point where you start to make money from taking photos all the time, that's when you're going to notice it. But, yeah. Mm -hmm it does start to matter when you get to a point. So, yeah. Invest in the good cons- <laughs> If you're shooting for people as well, like other people are relying on you. So having a pro- like equipment that is consistent and going to work every time is going to make your life so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to have a lens that autofocuses. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, so a guy I shot, I don't know, we're going to ramble on a little bit more, but. Ah, do it. It's good. Um, so I've been shooting the Vic Enduro series for I don't know, probably six or seven years now since yep. it, since it started. And I would get the each club to to fork out to to pay all the you know the resort management or whatever to pay money for me to shoot photos for them, but also for the riders as well. So sometimes I do a rider gallery. Sometimes I just shoot fifty photos for the for the for the event management Mm -hmm. and um i was doing every every race every round and then there was one guy who was working for the bright brewery and he got called up to do the bright round because he bright brewery sponsors the Mm -hmm. the event so he got called up still still charged the same amount that i would charge but he struggled because he didn't have the right gear and Mm -hmm they're not going to give him a phone call back, are they? Because he just struggled. And I spoke to him. He lives just down the road. And he says, I'm, I need to start getting some good, some better gear. And, yeah, we've shot a lot of races together, actually. We've shot three or four races. Um, he does some work for Dean Lucas, some video stuff. But, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now he's, now he's doing stuff for Falls Creek for winter. So, yeah. That's sick. Now he's... He's finally got a really nice camera and he started to get some really good lenses. And now you can see his work improving significantly. Like it's mm. insane because he's always been a great photographer. He's got a really good eye, really dedicated, and he loves doing it. But now that he's getting the gear, he's just loving it even more and getting mm. clients, getting paid a lot more than, than he used to. So, yeah. The gear is expensive though. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. God, it's, damn, it's expensive. Yeah, it's not a... And that that that's that really can justify you having to charge a little bit more for for the events if you're spending like when I went to Europe I had twenty thousand dollars in my bag that was on the plane yeah right. and yeah. just like 
I thought you just meant cash. <laughs> <laughs> just got some running. To that. <laughs> and it's funny because the bag weighs 16 kilos. You're only allowed 10 kilos of luggage on, but I'm still just bringing it all on. So I'm not putting this under the plane. <laughs> it's weird. My bike's all, my bag is always magically lighter when I chuck it on that scale. It's, I don't know how it happens. <laughs> But yeah, you, you do need you do need to fork out eventually man, if yeah. you want to get to the next level. That's that's my best advice. But yeah, keep shooting, keep doing it, and then you'll notice when you get to a point, you will you'll like I did with shooting next to Boris. You notice you notice the difference. Yeah, yeah. Every time I sit a local race shooting next to Fletcher, <laughs> it's the difference. <laughs> Is there anything you would have uh, done differently or changed up until now? Oh, no. Nah. Oh, it's that's a hard question because I look back on because I'm I'm nearly 40, I'm 39 next year. Am I? No, I'm 40 next year. Yeah. <laughs> and I've done a lot of really cool stuff in the last five years. And I wish, oh, probably last so 2015, I started doing a lot of cool traveling and a lot of adventures. Mm. And that was only eight years ago. And I wish I had done more of that when I was in my 20s. Yeah, okay. I still did a lot of cool stuff. Like I I traveled the whole the whole country, saw lots of stuff, worked in some really cool places, but I didn't really do any cool photography stuff or any cool riding stuff. I kind of mm. left uni and I didn't I did a lot of shoot a little a little bit of shooting and a little bit of riding, but not as much as I if I look back on it, I would have loved to have gone to Europe and and shot stuff or traveled in or ridden in Europe um, mm. earlier because it's just amazing. Like um I think I can still picture myself doing all the stuff that I wanted to do, though, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. When I was younger. Like I feel like I want to go um and follow like a European World Cup season and just travel around on a bike. Yeah. Get a, get a touring bike, ride from one event to the next and shoot every event and then just That'd be sick. do a riding tour around Europe on the on the way. Like I think that would be a sick trip for a young person to do, like a 20-year-old who's just left school or left mm. uni or whatever. Like I think that's the time to do that kind of thing but I still want to do that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, not really, but I don't regret anything I've done, but not. I, I think I would have liked to have done more of that stuff. I mean, I didn't have a house mortgage or a car loan to pay off. And, uh, yeah, a little bit more freedom. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I'm glad I travelled and did all the dumb stuff early. <laughs> but then on the flip side, you got no money and... <laughs> like it's yeah it's sometimes well, it's easy still, when you're I definitely still dirt bagged around but it was mainly just around Oz and just did you know I worked hospitality for about 10 years um yeah right just all around all around Oz from Cairns all the way down to Hobart um but yeah kind of yeah. it was it was a good time but I feel like I didn't I didn't really follow my passions of cycling either riding BMX or riding mountain bike. I didn't actually start mountain biking until 2012. Yeah, right. I've, I've been BMXing since the, the mid-90s. Mm. Um, so I felt like I could have found mountain biking a lot sooner if I mm. kind of stuck to that passion because I kind of lost it. I lost. The, I shot some weddings after university and kind of lost the passion of shooting. Like I, yeah, that would do it too. Weddings, yeah. were, it was great money, and it was like, yeah, I'm a professional now. I'm gonna do and shoot weddings and shoot, shoot stuff that I fucking hate, like real estate. Like it's great money, but it, I, I lost the love of taking photos. Yeah, and I only really found it again when I started taking photos up at our dirt jumps up in, uh, up at the O six eight, our BMX dirt jumps, which my brother and I have built over the last 15 years. Yeah. Right. So I got back to taking photos of bike riding and riding bikes. That's it, I had, I kind of left that for about 10 years. Mm. So I feel like I, I definitely regret doing that because I feel like I could have done a lot more with taking photos of bikes a lot sooner and, you know, 
I yeah. never ever want to take wedding photos ever. <laughs> like, I don't understand how people do it. Hey, like it just doesn't seem enjoyable. I'm sure it's there's people that love it. it yeah, I, I mean, there's lots. I get I get phone calls all the time about doing random photo jobs, like photos of kids and photos of dogs and. I've done some like really random real estate jobs um, and it's just I'm, I'm pushing the shutter and I'm just like going, this is like the furthest thing I want to be taking photos of. Like mm. and I feel like when you, it, when you lose the passion for something from doing the thing that you're doing, like it's wrong. Like you just need to, that's why literally the only thing I take photos of is riding bikes. Um, so I'm super, I'm pretty lucky with that, to be honest. And every time I get paid when I'm taking a photo of a, a bike rider, it's just a, just an added bonus. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I took family photos for a friend the other day and that was fun because yeah. it was for a family friend, but if it was some yeah. random, I don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. It's too close. <laughs> I'd need like a 700 mil lens cause I don't want to be that close to, <laughs> to kids. <laughs> um. What events have you got planned coming up? Like what's your calendar look like after think, that huge trip? I haven't even looked at it to be honest. I mean, I've 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 got back from Europe and I've just shot the best race, one of the best races in history. Yeah. yeah. It's like I shit you not, like I haven't even looked at my camera. I haven't even looked at the Australian calendar yet. I don't even know if there is that much coming up. There's a lot to be announced still. Um, obviously nationals got announced today. I'm definitely going to go to that in February. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know who I'll be shooting for yet, but we'll, we'll organize that in the next month or so. Uh, Red Hill Enduro champs aren't far away. Maybe a few weeks, I think. I don't even know what date they're on. Um, 21st to the 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be there shooting that. Or now. For now. <laughs> oh boy. Um, yeah, I saw your little post about about that today. I didn't look into it yet. The the schedule there for Red Hill. Oh, there is no schedule yet. There is um, no, okay. There yeah, yeah. It's only a month away. Uh, yeah. but the original posts were the twenty second to the twenty third. So yeah. Saturday was gonna be practice and the twenty third was race day. Yeah. So naturally everyone booked their flights to fly in for the Friday and leave on the Monday. But then someone checked the website and it's now the 21st to the 23rd. Yeah, right. Apparently practice is on the Friday. Race juniors on races Saturday. on the yeah. juniors and like B grade-ish races race on the yeah. Saturday and then elites race on the Sunday. Yeah. But okay. that was only discovered because someone went to the Oz Cycling website. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we could talk about Oz Cycling for a while, but I'd rather not. They They... I've got some really good friends at Oz Cycling um, and we've had, especially at Medina, we had some, because I was staying, I was working for Oz Cycling at Nationals and I was staying with a lot of the people there. They had a few houses booked out and I was staying with some very well-informed people and quite opinionated people. Um, so I heard some stuff and I'm not going to repeat here, but <laughs> um I feel like there's some really good people at Oz Cycling who are really trying hard to do what everyone wants them to do, but it's just really, it's just a lot more difficult for them now to 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 do what they want to do. Um, mm. It's a shame because a lot of the people I know are really good. They're, they're good friends, um, and they're trying so hard, and nothing's nothing's working out for them. So that's yeah. a shame. Um, I, I think it's. Weird in a way that well, cycling is deemed to be a person. Mm. And if I, uh, people say something about odd cycling, they're being very direct or mean towards some a person. Yeah. But there's a lot of good people that are trying to do the right thing. It's just yeah. not very organized. Um, yeah. Like I've got good friends that work there well and people that, inform me of things so i try not to be i try to actually do research you know i'm not throwing shit out on the internet and hoping it sticks yeah yeah 
and we're talking and yeah, same experiences you've had. There's some really, really, really good people trying to do really, really good things, but it's just not happening yeah. yet. So we'll see. But yeah, there's also other events coming up. There's the, all the down, big downhill stuff hasn't been announced. I don't know what's happening with that. Um, the the crew behind that. So there's only a really small crew of kind of volunteers who organize the big downhill stuff. And every year there's less and less people. There's basically two families that do it, the Currys and the Newhams. And it's basically four, five, six people. And they run the whole series. They organize all the prizes. They organize all the, Basically everything. Or when we when we run one of their races, we have to do timing and registration and get the track ready, and that's about it. They do all the rest, which is still a lot of work. But they do that, and they run the probably you know they run the best series in in the country, hands down. Mm. And I, I feel like it's getting really hard for them to to keep doing it because there's so few people doing it. Um, there was talk about a joint. Oz cycling, VDHS uh, run thing going on, but I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if clubs are keen to have Oz cycling involved in the in the Vic rounds. So yeah, fingers. We'll see what happens with that. But yeah, mm. I think more the more races the better. But I think it's very difficult for this well established group of people who run amazing races to have another body coming in to try and kind of get in on it and but at the same time it's hard because the Oz cycling are trying to bring in this nationals series again which will give UCI points for all the juniors mm-hmm. so they can go and race overseas and get them points so the only way for them to do that is to either run their own thing or get on the back of existing clubs and existing events so yeah it's it's hard it's yeah I don't, I don't think we'll have Ever with, see? Uh, I don't think we'll ever see Oz Cycling run an event. Like it's always going to be off the back of someone else, yeah, because yeah. they just don't have the manpower, yeah, or the skills. But then, yeah, it's crazy to think you know we've got one of the biggest volunteer run sports in the country. Yeah, like there's literally six people right organizing a whole race series. Yeah, like that's insane. It's the same down here. We might have ten people. Yeah. And like it, this whole sport is evolved from these people that spent all their time volunteering. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's, I don't know, there's the Vic Enduro series as well. I do a bit of that. Um, yeah. But yeah. I haven't even looked at the calendar, to be honest. Um, I've got to make some phone calls about some tourism stuff coming up. I, I was actually supposed to call them before I went overseas, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, shit happens. <laughs> it's good. I love I love working doing that stuff because it's we get to go some to some awesome places and it's all it's all black riding stuff. It's all mm. ride high country black riding stuff. So we get to go to the top of mountains and take photos of cool people doing doing cool stuff. It's just for tourism. So yeah. And are it, you going to crankworks? Nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Sick. I'm I, not I don't even. One. <laughs> <laughs> so. Crank, that's like we spoke about before with with Cannonball Crankworks being that whole festival vibe. Like, I yeah. feel like there's only two events that I would like to go and see would be the slope style and downhill. That's that's all I would go there for. All the other mm. little things, the spinny, the dual slalom, the, the speed and style. Like, it just doesn't interest me. Um, mm. I don't know. If it's just because it's just a little. It's just its own thing. It's its own. Um entity crankworks and it's all that festival vibe and everyone's there in the village and mm. it's not the pinnacle of the sport for me True. i think the downhill that they have is sick the, like the canadian cup downhill that they have and at, at whistler is sick yeah i was open Obviously, round two right yeah <laughs> it's basically all australians that were all there yeah, yeah racing yeah. yeah and i think the slope style is sick i know i didn't realize how sick it was until we went to Highline and and watch that like it that was a really cool event really cool vibe and I feel obviously Crankworks is just the next level up from that 
and I've never really been into slope style because I grew up riding BMX and mm. all the BMX tricks and all the BMX jumps have always been so much. Like obviously there's the smaller bike, so they can do a lot more. And when I see a like a, a tail whip on a mountain bike, it doesn't look as appealing to me as a BMX doing a triple tail whip on the same jump. If you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so that's why I've never really been into slope style. But then when I went to Highline, it was sick. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, and I think because they were going so huge, that was the the biggest mm. difference for me. They go so much bigger on the on the mountain bikes than they do on the BMXs. And it doesn't translate to film. Like mm. that boner log was what at least fifteen feet tall. Yeah. And then it sent them another 10 feet and you're just like, oh, okay. Yeah. I get it now. Yeah. 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 When you're standing there, like I stood on the couple, top of a couple of jumps and I'm just like, yeah, I wouldn't jump that. And they're doing front flips and double back flips over. Like, yeah, it was, it was sick. So, yeah, I think I'd love to see the, the crank work slope style, the courses that, or the jumps and that, that they've built there, the red dirt with the green grass mm-hmm. and the blue sky. It looks sick. But, yeah bit of a far way to, it's like you know other side of the country just to go and see two events that i'd that i'd go and, that i'd like to see but yeah it's a big trek it's expensive mm. that's a big week so yeah yeah i'm definitely not going yeah well i haven't looked at it what is it it's, it's two, it weeks. Week? two, two weeks, weeks. Yeah, i think it's there. a weekend before <laughs> it's a weekend before red hill yeah yeah, so we got a bunch of crew from SA. The last round of the downhill is this weekend. Then they go to Crank Rooks and then they go to Red Hill on the way home. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So that, that crew does a lot of traveling. They a lot of uh, domestic travel. It's a good crew they've got over there in SA. We have to. Like, yeah. Like you just get used to it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. true. Like, and the convoys are good. So it'll be yeah. like five cars or something and we'll just travel together and it's, it's just a sick vibe the actual yeah, travel it does, itself it does look like that and just helping okay. everyone it's it's a really really good vibe we've got going at the moment yeah i think for just people who want to race yeah yeah um last question seems to be the hardest for a lot of people you've probably heard it but um if you're <laughs> deep into a photo editing session at four o'clock in the morning and you need to get motivated do you have any music or anything I'm you a listening? weird one with music. I think I'm probably the weirdest you've had. I either like melodic death metal. Sick. Yeah. Um, like Insomnium or Bellacore or a Monomath. A lot of um kind of Finnish Swedish. <laughs> yep. uh, there's a couple of Aussie bands I like as well. Um, melodic death metal. Or I like symphony music. So yeah, that pairs up. Um, a lot of stuff from film scores like Hans Zimmer, yeah, uh, John Williams, all those, all those kind of film scores. So everything, almost, I think that just comes from my. When I first went to uni to study photography, I was really heavily into film. I was going down the filmmaking path, like mm-hmm. wanting to go to film school and become like a, a cinematographer to make like Hollywood movies. That was, that was my, my dream. I wanted to graduate from uni and then go to Sydney and go to film school. And that just, I don't know why it didn't happen. I just didn't, I don't know. The private school I wanted to go to was super expensive and there was no like loan scheme that you could do, but it was Mm -hmm. like the only one I was interested in. Yeah. Um, But yeah, just didn't, didn't, didn't go. And then, yeah always loved film all my inspiration from from uni um all the projects i did were all from from movies like all the cinematography and like the matrix um was Mm -hmm. just like mind-blowing to me and all the part of that was the music as well like i loved watching a movie and seeing the visuals but also every time i heard the music from it i'd get taken back to that visual Mm -hmm. so yeah I think editing photos, listening to like film score music for me is yeah, that's 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 my jam. I think mm. 
And if I need to wake up, it's just, yeah, put some insomnium on. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. melodic death metal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd, yeah, there seems to be a a tie there between metal and artists. But, yeah, I've got another photo friend down here. He shot multiple 2020 covers and yeah. shot a bunch of shit. And, yeah, every time he's editing, he just he'll send us a Snapchat or a video and it's just, melodic death metal pumping <laughs> like so loud and I don't I can't edit to that but yeah <laughs> next level uh, it's yeah I, do, I actually don't listen to when I'm editing I yeah it's always it's got to be soft and it's got to have no lyrics because I'll just get carried away and I won't focus <laughs> on what I'm doing yeah but I'll, I'll be sitting there like so focused on doing the editing that I, I won't even hear the music. I won't even, it'll just, mm. it'll just be noise a lot of the time. Um, yeah. It just gets so deep in your own screen. Oh yeah. Screen time, man. It's crazy. And yeah, <laughs> two hours and it feels like you've been there for 15 minutes. Yeah. Dude, some of the longest, the longest days I had in front of the computer were like, you just, I'm falling asleep. Like I'm sitting there, literally got the clone tool and I'm cloning something out and I'm, I'm, I'm like head <laughs> on the keyboard falling asleep. <laughs> you accidentally clone like two heads into someone because you're <laughs> half asleep. <laughs> uh, easy, man. Well, I better let you get on with the rest of your day. It's been an amazing chat. Really yeah, enjoyed absolutely. it. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thanks. I'm glad we got to finally sit down. I know. It's been a it's been a while, basically yeah. on my my end. But yeah, thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Yeah. Easy man. I'll let you get to the rest of your day and uh I'll let you know when this is going up. Nice. Have a good thanks, one. Thanks, man. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. So there we go. That was that awesome chat with Matt Russo, one of the best photographers and also best humans you ever meet on the side of a trail. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, thanks so much to our supporters, Trek, NS Dynamics, Taylor Trails, Lead Out Sports, Franked, Dirt Surfers, Crush, Fist. These guys keep the podcast running, keep us expanding and keep us paying the bills, essentially. Um, make sure you head over to Franked and use that code Beyond the Tape 10. Fist, you get used Beyond the Tape, you get a bit of a discount. Uh, Dirt Surfers is the same. And yeah, thanks so much for, for everything. Um, if you want to support the podcast yourself, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell your dog, tell whoever is listening about the podcast, share it on your Instagram, share it on your socials, share it on your MySpace if you still got it, um, share it around. And if you want to bump it up in the charts a little bit, go over to iTunes or wherever you listen to your app, throw us a review. I'm also after any critical reviews so I can keep improving this podcast. Anyway, thanks so much. And until the next one, have a bunch of fun.